Students have often been introduced to the notion of consumer surplus in principles of economics and sometimes wonder, that doesn't seem to be fair. If you have uh, well, just one price, then consumers get a surplus. How about firms? Why don't firms get a surplus? So let's talk about that because actually there is a notion of producer surplus as well. So we're going to ask the question, what's the benefit that cons producers who as a group want to supply Q1 units to the market obtain if they can sell at just one price instead of selling it some other kind of way. And the other kind of way we're going to come up with is again a very artificial way but it's a way of squeezing from the producers the, the product at the, at the lowest price that they would possibly be willing to accept to produce Q1 units. And here's the way it's done. We'll suppose that the producers need to sell to an auctioneer who represents the consumers. They can't sell to consumers in any other way but through the auctioneer. And so the producers gather in a room and bid for the right to sell their output to the consumers. And the auctioneer starts by saying, our consumers don't really want to buy a lot of your stuff. We, they only want to buy QA units of your stuff. Would any of you like to bid to supply this small QA amount of stuff to, to the consumers whom I represent? And you know what's going to happen is that, let me turn that a little bit better, is that the consumers will bid up the price to here. I'm sorry, the producers will bid up the price to here. And so remember that the framework that we have from the co from costs is that costs are rising. Uh, we don't have we don't have increasing returns to scale or anything because the supply curve is going up. So it's cheapest to produce at a small scale. And when the producers expand their scale, their costs go up. I know that might be counterintuitive. Uh, often in the real world, you have increasing returns to scale. So as you produce more, costs go down. But uh, you, as you know, you can't have a competitive industry in that kind of situation. So we're not dealing with, with the increasing returns to scale case. All right, so the producers uh, are willing to uh, to produce QA at a price of PA and the amount of money that changes hands in this first auction is this. And so the producers are just about to leave and the auctioneer says, well actually maybe my customers are interested in somewhat more of your product. The extra amount is QB minus QA. Does anybody want to bid for selling my customers the, the difference between that? And as you know, the answer is going to be yes, and that's what the price is going to be, uh, PB. And the amount of money that changes hands in that auction is going to be this. So the producers think everything is done. They start to leave the room. And the auctioneer says, "Well, actually, maybe our, maybe my customers will be willing to buy even more quantity QC minus QB. Does anybody want to bid for producing that? And the bids will come at a price of PC. And the amount of money that changes hands in that auction will be QC minus QB." times PC. I think you know where this is headed. The auctioneer is going to lie multiple times. There are going to be lots of different auctions. Every single auction the firms are going to think is going to be the last auction, but it it isn't until you get all the way to Q1. So each of these auctions are going to raise going to result in different prices.
and I'll then mark how much money changes hands in each one. Okay, so here I've marked how much money changes hands in each one of the auctions. So producers would be willing to supply Q1 even if they only got this area, which as you can see if an infinite number of auctions were conducted then the area would be the entire area under the supply curve. So that's the amount of money that you absolutely positively have to pay the firms if you want to get them to supply Q1. If they face only one price then for Q1, the price is going to be P1. And then the actual amount of money that the firms receive isn't going to be just the, that, the purple area. The actual amount of money that the firms receive is going to be the whole rectangle, P1 times Q1, the whole thing. So they get a bonus. And the bonus is the excess over the minimum amount of money they'd be willing to receive in order to supply Q1 on the one hand and the actual amount of money that they do receive if there's only one price and that's P1 Q1 and that bonus is the area bounded by these um, circles not those circles, these circles different color Okay, so it's the excess over the amount of money that they enjoy, this big rectangle, when they only have to face one price, versus the smaller amount that they'd be willing to accept in order to produce Q1. So the excess is this, and that's producer surplus. Okay, so there is a concept of producer surplus. And it's the, oh, let me type it. So producer surplus is the excess of, on the one hand, what producers receive for Q1 if they face only one price over the minimum amount producers would be willing to receive to produce Q1. So that's producer surplus. One side comment I want to make. Situations in which the good is sold not one price, uh, two or more prices. It's called the situation of price discrimination. So price discrimination is when the good is sold essentially simultaneously. It could also be at a, a sequentially suppose like an auction market but um, a good is sold at more than one price now price discrimination is not illegal in the US for example you have senior citizen discounts so the same good is sold at a different price to senior citizens than to other people and similarly, if you have a firm that's selling in two different markets, let's say in two different states, it might charge different prices in the different states. So price discrimination is not illegal. It, it's just it's a situation where the good is sold at more than one price. The term perfect price discrimination describes the kind of auction market that I was talking about in this video and in the previous video, the one where instead of having PA, PB, PC, and so forth. You had an infinite number of auctions, each one infinitesimally small, so that the, uh, in, in this example here with producer surplus, so that you squeeze the, the, the producers to the maximum extent possible, or the other video in producer surplus, you squeeze the consumers to the maximum extent possible. So these kind of situations where where you don't you don't have any of these of these uh, tri triangular areas, but instead you capture everything under the supply curve or, or the demand curve for consumers, 
uh, that's what's called perfect price discrimination. So finally, let's summarize that uh, producer surplus from the, the graph here is the area above the supply curve the area above the supply curve above the supply curve and below the price line So it's, a, it's important to remember the definition of producer surplus that I typed on the right, but it's also quite important to know the, the way to pick out producer surplus in a graph. So the way to pick out producer surplus in a graph is this. It's the area above the supply curve and below the price line. Finally, one not particularly important comment about another way to interpret producer surplus. Think about what producer surplus is. It's the excess Think about what it is per unit, the marginal if, producer surplus, if you will, the producer surplus for just one unit. It's the difference in uh, P and the minimum payment that you'd have to give this firm in order to in order for it to agree to produce. Now, if you give it too small of a payment, it's going to shut down. So fundamentally, this has something to do with the shutdown rule. And if you pay the firm less than average variable cost, it's going to shut down because it's not covering its variable costs. So you got to pay it at least that. And if you do pay it the average variable cost, it will produce. So if we have that, then that times Q is uh, is going to be the the well the producer surplus it's tempting although not quite right to extend this as follows if you multiply this out you get PQ minus average variable cost times Q which is PQ minus variable cost I can add and subtract fixed cost from that. Actually, let me fl flip the other way. Uh, let me subtract and add fixed cost. And then you see that this is profit. And therefore, it seems one can interpret producer surplus as profit plus fixed cost or if it was in the long run it would just be profit so in the short run profit fixed cost because you don't really have you don't have to give the firms their fixed costs in order to get them to produce all you have to do is is uh, allow them to cover their variable cost so if you're giving them the fixed cost that's extra gravy and so that's part of producer surplus now what's not satisfactory about this is that producer surplus is a concept for the entire industry and so what I've just done with the mathematics is just for one firm. Another way to see this is average variable cost is actually not a constant. It's a variable that depends on Q, but here I've treated it as if it were a constant. So so uh, this isn't quite right. So you, you can think of producer surplus as being related to profit, but it's not exactly the same thing, and one has to be a little careful uh, being too quick about just saying producer surplus is, is the same as profit. But there is some kind of relationship between producer surplus and profit.